On mentioning to Tarquin, Pensual Monument was to feature in an upcoming video. He spluttered on his vodka. My vodka, actually. Reddened, looked as if he'd been asked to stand for the National Anthem and said, Why are you making a video on a Masonic temple? Masons are corrupt satanic half-wits. I asked if he wished to expand on his Masonic thoughts for a section of the video, to which he replied, the sort of person who doesn't realise what the Masons are about is the sort of person who doesn't realise how Bradley Wiggins, Paula Radcliffe, Sebastian Cole, Stephen Redgrave, Chris Hoy, Jessica Rennis, Christopher Froome, etc. won all those medals and is beyond my help. Goodbye. Let's continue in a Masonic vein with an 1844 newspaper report of Penshaw Monument's foundation stone laying. Newcastle Journal, Saturday 31st August 1844. The foundation stone of the monument to be erected on Penshaw Hill near Houghtonley Spring in the county of Durham to the memory of the late John George Lambton, Earl of Durham, was laid on Wednesday last with Masonic honours amidst an immense concourse of spectators assembled from all parts of the adjoining district. The deceased nobleman, having held the distinguished position of Provincial Grand Master of the Free and Accepted Master of Northumberland and Durham, that body naturally felt the deepest anxiety to have an opportunity of showing the respect in which they held the talents and the manner in which they revered the memory of their late illustrious leader and it was in consequence determined that the foundation stone of this memorial to his memory should be laid with all the pomp and circumstance which Masonic honours could confer. It was arranged accordingly that the Right Honourable Earl of Zetland, Grand Master of England, should lay the stone, assisted by a number of grand officers who would appear robed in the investiture, wearing the jewels and carrying the insignia of the Grand Lodge of England. What? No goat? In a field on the south side of the hill, a large pavilion was erected for the accommodation of the Masons, and here a provincial Grand Lodge was opened by the Earl of Zetland, the most worshipful Grand Master. The entrance of the pavilion was tastefully ornamented with evergreens, amongst which the laurel, yew and cypress were conspicuously visible. The goat must be in the pavilion then. The Earl of Zetland arrived at Fence House's station about one o'clock, accompanied by Mark Milbank Esquire, where he was received by Henry John Spearman Esquire of Newton Hall, the chairman of the building committee, who conducted him to the ground where, on alighting, he was met by the Marcus of Londonderry, the Honourable Mr Phipps, and several of the committee and was then received by the grand officers with whom he retired into the pavilion. Where the goat awaited its fate. After the usual ceremonies, the Masonic body formed into procession with a band of music in front and proceeded by a winding path to the summit of the hill in the order following. Police officers, a band of music, two tylers. Next, two grand stewards bearing the banner of the Grand Lodge of England. Next, the wardens, past wardens and masters of several lodges according to rank, juniors walking first. Next, cornucopia with corn, borne by a master of the lodge. Two ewers with wine and oil, borne by two masters of lodges. The masters were flanked by a grand steward on each side. Next, in double file, on the left, the officers and past officers of the Grand Lodge of Northumberland, juniors walking first, and on the right side, the Grand Lodge of Durham. We'll stop the list of those in the procession here. It goes on forever. 
On reaching the place where the interesting ceremony was to be performed, and which was protected from intrusion by a wooden barricade guarded by a detachment of the Dorham Rural Police, the brethren divided right and left, facing inwards, forming an avenue for the most worshipful Grand Master to pass through, preceded by his banner and the Grand Sword, and followed by the Ionic Light, the Deputy Grand Master and Grand Officers, who took up their respective stations on a platform which had been erected for the purpose. The stone was then raised, and the lower half, it being divided into two, having been adjusted, the Grand Secretary read aloud the inscription engraven on the brass plate intended to enclose a cavity which had been formed in the upper face of the lower stone as a depository, as follows. As Tarquin says, satanic. Anyway, here's the inscription. This stone was laid by the Earl of Zetland, Grand Master of the Free and Accepted Masons of England, assisted by the Brethren of the Provinces of Durham and of Northumberland, on the 28th of August 1844, being the foundation stone of the monument to be erected to the memory of John George, Earl of Durham, who, after representing the County of Durham in Parliament for 15 years, was raised to the peerage and subsequently held the office of Lord Privy Seal, Ambassador Extraordinary and Minister at St Petersburg and Governor General. General of Canada. He died on the 28th July 1840 in the 49th year of his age. This monument is erected by the private subscriptions of his fellow countrymen, admirers of his public principles and exemplary private virtues. Jesus wept. That was a long inscription. The Grand Treasurer then placed a file containing a number of coins of the present reign in the cavity and the brass plate having been placed thereon, the Grand Master proceeded to adjust the same and spread the mortar with a silver trowel which was handed to him for that purpose. The upper stone was then lowered slowly into its place, the band playing Rule Britannia. Rule Britannia? I think I'm going to be sick. The trowel which was manufactured by Messrs. Reed and Sons of Newcastle upon Tyne, bore the following inscription. No, we're not having another ridiculously long inscription. All you need to know is that the reverse side of the trout had an engraving of the monument. The Grand Master then proceeded to adjust the position and form the stone by the plumb, level and square, which were successively delivered to him by the Deputy Grand Master. Being satisfied in regard to these particulars, he gave the stone three knocks with them all, the cornucopia containing the corn and the ewers with the wine and oil were then handed to the Grand Master who strewed the corn, poured the wine and oil over the stone with the accustomed ceremonies in performing which he said impressively, No. We're not repeating his nonsense speech either. Next there was a prayer from the Reverend Robert Green of Newcastle, the Provincial Grand Chaplain of the Order, which was also nonsense. The Earl of Zetland and others present examined the plans of the proposed erection, which were submitted to them by Mr John Green, after which the procession was reformed and the Masonic Brethren returned to the pavilion where no doubt they concluded their satanic rituals shielded from the ignorant public, of which there was an estimated 20,000 in attendance for this foundation stone laying ceremony. In a PDF named Our Masonic History, John George Lampton and Penshaw Monument, concern was shown when it was stated an interloper, or Cowan in Masonic terms, was lent Masonic fancy dress to enter the pavilion. Brother Turner stood charged with lending a cowan an apron by which he gained admittance to the Grand Lodge Pavilion at Penshaw, when Brother Spark put a motion to the chair where the brethren of an opinion that Brother Turner supplied the apron to the intruder knowing that he was not a mason. The worshipful master put it to a show of hands when it was universal in his favour, thus suggesting Brother Turner was exonerated. Before we leave the foundation stone laying ceremony, 
It should be noted that work had already been underway for several months on the monument, ensuring the audience had something to see. Other than a bunch of corrupt masons, of course. The Earl of Durham's monument, to give its official title, was designed by Newcastle upon Tyne architects John and Benjamin Green. John being Benjamin's father. Construction was undertaken by Sunderland-based Thomas Pratt, and the project cost £3,000. The Green Partnership was also responsible for Newcastle's Theatre Royal and Grey's Monument. In the form of a Grecian temple, the historic order of architecture pays tribute to the Temple of Theseus in Athens. Doric was the earliest of the three orders in classical Greek architecture, Ionic and Corinthian being the other two. Doric can be recognised by circular capitals below a square cushion, above which sits a plain architrave and baseless columns directly into the stylobate. Technically speaking, it's tetrastyle, hypathral, and also peristyle, commencing with a stylobate six feet high from the ground in two divisions of three feet each. Non-technically speaking, tetrastyle means there are four columns at the front. Hypathral informs it's roofless, Peristyle indicates columns all around. And stylobate is a step platform upon which columns are placed. Total length is 100 feet, with the width spanning slightly over half that distance at 53 feet. Reaching 70 feet from the ground at one end, with the opposite end measuring 62 feet from the ground, it stands 446 feet above sea level. There are 18 columns standing 35 feet 9 inches tall. Their diameter measures 6 feet 6 inches, a dimension that allows for a spiral staircase in one of the south columns to access the entablature promenade. The entablature is 13 feet 6 inches high, and at each end is surmounted by a pediment. The Newcastle Journal of August 31st, 1844 stated certain design decisions allowed the monument to be completed on a lesser budget than conventional construction methods. These decisions included building all walls in the foundations and hollow construction of the entablature and columns, thus reducing materials and so cost. Though other sources state only the stair column is hollow, with the remaining columns being solid. Stone was supplied from the quarries of New Pentia, located one mile from the hilltop. Lime was sourced from New Bottled Kilns, also a one mile distance, and sand from the foot of the hill. The materials were transported to the summit by a temporary winding railway, which after construction completion was intended to form a permanent carriage conveying visitors up the somewhat steep incline. But an intention was all it remained. When finished, access to the entablature was obtained by paying one penny for a key to unlock the door in the south column housing the 74-step spiral stairs, a practice that continued for many years. Unfortunately, Temple Arthur Scott, a 15-year-old boy, fell to his death on the promenade on Easter Monday 1926, after which the promenade was deemed dangerous and the column door locked. By 1947 the door had been broken open, allowing the stairs to be climbed once again. The door was resealed with cement, but that proved little deterrent and was soon breached, resulting in the entrance being bricked up, which then held firm against the intruders. In August 2011, the National Trust opened the stairs for the first time in 85 years. It was, however, only open for 90 people, disappointing those who weren't at the head of the queue. Tours to the promenade now run from Good Friday to the end of September each weekend and bank holiday. Cost is £5. Tarquin informs me the National Trust are as bad as the Masons, so they won't be getting my £5. In 1959, its 115th year of existence, the monument had become endangered from mining subsidence, and responsibility fell on the National Coal Board to undertake repairs. 
The subsidence caused wide cracks on the north, south and west sides, and in one instance, the upper balcony had broken away and moved outwards to overhang the remainder of the memorial. Cracks were filled and the damaged 18 feet by 15 feet half ton stone blocks were lowered to the ground to be replaced by concrete blocks faced with stone of 4 inch depth to conceal the restoration. The damaged stone blocks can be seen scattered around the foot of the monument. <laughs>